All right, coming up this morning at about 9.40, we're going to dive into the whole union talk. The governor is proposing some legislation, and it's being backed by at least one state senator, Shannon Jones, who's going to join us at 9.40, that would say public unions, public worker unions in the state cannot strike. I don't know why that would be such a difficult concept for people. If your job is so important, as I'm often told by the public workers, they tell me how valuable their job is. Now they keep the state running, or the federal government if it's a federal worker. They tell me it's that important. Public safety, security, processing information for the state. They're that valuable. If you're that valuable, why? How could we allow you to strike? It'd be like the U.S. military saying, yeah, we're going to go ahead and strike every now and then. No, you say, we need you there. You're critical. Well, it's one of two ways for you public service workers. You who work for uh, uh, schools, government agencies, safety and security workers, emergency respond, any of those. If, it's, if your job is that vital, how can we allow you to strike? Or is your job not that vital? You can't have it both ways. Take some calls on it coming up next. 700 WLD. Coming up today on the big show with Bill Cunningham, 133, a Valentine's Day scandal in Reading. A Valentine's Day scandal in Reading, 133 with Bill Cunningham. Very interesting. If we don't allow police and firefighters to strike, why would we say, why would we put other public employees on the same level? The new bill, Senate Bill 5, that's being considered. Teachers, local government employees would lose the ability to negotiate pay, benefits, and working conditions, would ban them from striking. It would weaken the arbitration for um, police and firefighters. It would limit a local union's right to bargain for health insurance, eliminate automatic pay increases for public employees, and strip teachers of the right to pick their classes or schools. Some of the things that it would do. Why is that a bad thing? See, we are their employers. This is what's lost in this whole thing. I get emails over the weekend when I talked about this on Friday from some public employees who are all upset by this. In fact, a bunch of them packed the state house last week. Instead of being honest and open, that what's really going on here is the not me, is selfishness. It's, I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to lose my benefits. I want to continue to make the money. Me, me, me. If everyone continues to do that, we are screwed as a country. We are certainly screwed as a state. $10 billion in debt. The things that got us there is the me, me, me attitude. We're all in this. We've all made bad choices by electing the wrong people and allowing them to continue to spend the way they have at the federal level and continue to negotiate contracts at the state and local levels that put us behind the eight ball, that screw us for years to come. Now, when it comes to something like General Motors, you want to get together, you want to, uh, as a union, tell management you demand more money, you're going to strike or whatever, fine. The downside of that is, you eventually, you will kill the golden goose. And that doesn't affect me. You kill the golden goose, the company goes belly up, doesn't affect me. Except when the government steps in and bails them out, which was the wrong thing to do. But when it comes to public employees, I am your boss. And I'm not going to let you run up the outrageous retirements that you have in the past. Because I know it's unsustainable. And most of the people that you claim to be serving do not have those type of retirements or benefits. Shannon Jones no, uh, joins me now. She's a senator. Santa, uh, Sh- Shannon, what area do you serve? I represent Warren and parts of Hamilton County. Tell me about Senate Bill 5 and why you're involved with it. 
Well, Senate Bill 5 is a bill that would reform Ohio's collective bargaining law. And it, in essence, is going to give managers the flexibility it needs to be able to manage its workforce to the mission. I mean, what that means is um, it's the same thing that families and businesses have had to deal with over the last couple of years. We all know that we're going to have uh, fewer resources, so um, what are we going to do to be more efficient to continue to provide high-quality services? I see this as employer and employee. I don't see it as in the, well, we're killing the middle class or trying to screw public employees. I see it as employer and employee. That, that's how I look at this entire thing. But we've been marketed, Senator, we've been marketed to believe that if we do not support unions, then you just hate the middle class. Yeah, I, I just don't get into any of those types of, you know, hyperbole and, and scare tactics. I think this is just simply about we are all in agreement. It doesn't matter who you are or what party you're affiliated with. Everybody agrees that we have fewer resources. And uh, we also know that taxpayers have said uh, uh, vehemently that they don't want to have their taxes increased. So if we agree that that's where we are, that we have fewer resources, then what kinds of efficiencies and flexibilities can we give to the employers so we can continue to provide the services? So if Senate Bill 5 were to be passed, it wouldn't be automatic that you're going to go in and start slashing jobs, taking people down. This just gives the state the ability to alter contracts and change and move and bob. Of course. I mean, look, you know, the vast majority of uh, public employees are good people who are trying to provide a good service for the public. And so it's not about, you know, what an individual's value is. It's about, and and after all, you know, they're going to be competing in the marketplace. We want good employees providing, you know, public service. So, you know, that's going to take care of itself. But what this is about is, you know, giving management the ability to to uh, deploy its workforce in a way that makes sense for the time. So, for example, what one person's job by contract might have been, you know, only to do data entry. Well, we need to give management the ability to say, okay, well, we don't need all data entry today. We need you to do some data entry, and then we need you to do some filing, and then we need you to answer the phones. We need you to do all of those things that help us uh, uh, provide the mission that taxpayers expect. The president of the uh, Fraternal Order of the Police, Brian Statzer, said uh, this bill shows animosity towards public employees. Look, I don't believe that it does. I've been a public employee almost my entire career. I value the work of public employees. This is just recognition that, you know, what everybody knows to be true is that we have fewer resources and we're going to continue to have fewer resources and the taxpayers no longer want to keep growing the size of government. So if that's the case, then how can we provide flexibility to management to be able to deploy its workforce in a way that allows us to continue to provide the service. That's what this is about. Now, the current system has been in place since 83. I think that was passed under Dick Celeste. I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. And look at where we have come (laughs) from decades ago over the past. How's Ohio been doing for the past couple of decades? Well, there's no doubt uh, that we we have um, some huge uh, budget problems here in this state. And, you know, this is just one of many issues that we're going to have to tackle. You know, there's no panacea out there. We have got to be willing to tackle not just collective bargaining, but certainly pension reform and, you know, reform to Medicaid program and, you know, everything from soup to nuts. The time has has come, um, maybe we could even argue that it's it's past and we need to play catch up, but the time has come that everything has to be on the table and we have to be willing to rethink the way that we provide state services. Change is hard, I know that, um, but we have to be willing to have reasonable, rational discussions about how we're going to do this better. And we need to start saying what is wrong and what is right regardless of if it affects me or my job. 
If something is wrong, it, we've done this for t- far too long when it comes to the, the public sector, certainly with unions involved, where they say, well, it may not. And, and listen, they all know in their heart that things are unsustainable, but it affects their job. And I can understand they don't want to be out looking for a job, but they accept the wrong things in order to keep their job. That's part of the problem. Well, look, we just have we have just passed that. Um, you know, I I wish that you know perhaps that that uh, we were in a different place where we didn't have to have these tough conversations. Mm-hmm. But but we're all in agreement that we're here, and so you know nobody's disputing that we're we're in a down economy. Nobody's disputing that we're going to have fewer revenues at state and local government. Nobody's disputing that that's going to be the case for a very long time, and nobody's disputing that taxpayers you know, are, are taxed enough. And so if nobody's disputing those things, you know, what is it that we can do? Well, we have to be able to provide some flexibility to be able to deploy the workforce in a way where we can continue to provide the services. I mean, we all know that that's going to, you know, create some efficiencies in the way, you know, we, we uh, supply those services because, You know, after all, that's what business has been doing for years. This is very much tied into the schools as well, because you've got, um, well, first of all, a system in Ohio that's been ruled unconstitutional by how we fund fund schools. We continue to pour money into education. And the the step increases, I'm speaking with Senator Shannon Jones, the, the step increases are outrageous. That it's smoke and mirrors where they say, well, we're going to, at the local level, we're going to go ahead and, and freeze our pay, whatever. Often it doesn't include the step increases, so they continue to make more and more money. Would Senate Bill 5, if it passes, would this um, allow uh, to, to, uh, for us to eliminate those step increases or gain control of them? Would that open yes. it up? Yes, actually, under Senate Bill 5, the automatic step increases will be removed from the law altogether. And so no longer, by virtue of um, being employed for another year, would you get an automatic raise. And you, you mentioned the point about um, levies and, and so forth and how the public, their understanding of, of the school funding system. And, you know, in, in my community, I'm asked all the time, why is it that um, the school board tells me that my teachers have gotten a raise, but yet the teachers themselves say that they aren't? Well, that's because there's a system that's been created over time where both things can technically be true at the same time. Senate Bill 5 is going to put a lot of transparency into, into place. It's going to eliminate, you know, uh, the step increases altogether. But most importantly, it's going to provide transparency for the public so they understand what the full compensation package is. It doesn't matter what you call it, a salary, a, a cost of living adjustment, or, or what have you. Um, the public views that as compensation, and they need to understand it in a transparent way. What about any current union comp- Contracts would those be grandfathered in, or would those help address those as well? Right, uh, any current contract would operate under um, to, to the contract's expiration, and so once those contracts expire, then um, if if Senate Bill Five became law, then they would negotiate uh, new contracts under the new law. All right, and obviously those things constantly come up for uh, renewal or renegotiation. They're That's right. they're all limited. They're all you know uh, sunsetted. Uh, what about um, school districts like Little Miami School District? Would those help any of those districts that are really, really struggling now? Would this help them um, if they were able to get a hold of these future contracts to, to cut costs and maybe keep it open? I, I suspect that that would, although I have to tell you, I don't know what the nature of the contracts are right now at Little Miami. It's possible that they're not under under um, uh, contracts at all, so okay. I can't speak to that. But, but you know, generally speaking, you know, I think what this is, what Senate Bill Five will do is will create a system where the public is really in tune with what's happening in the school district and how um, the the um, employees are being deployed. And look. I believe the public is fair. I believe the public, you know, wants um, good public employees. And I think if they are um, informed about what's going on, they're going to keep both sides, management and its employees, fair. All right. Well, I appreciate you joining me. What are, what are the odds that this is going to pass? Is this better than average? 
Look, I think I think uh, we're in a really good position, but you know, there's there's no doubt this is a difficult issue. So we just we're at the beginning of the process. Um, you know, we're going to have two hearings this week, Tuesday and Thursday, and and uh, hopefully we'll we'll you know be able to have a, a reasonable conversation about you know real reforms that have to happen. We just don't have any choice. All right. Thank you so much, State Senator Shannon Jones, uh, supporting Senate Bill 5. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, of course, there's a link to it. More information at my blog, 700WLW.com, keyword doc, brought to you by the American Trading Company. Doc Thompson on the big one, 700WLW. Mark Monahan now from the Firefighters Union. How you doing, Mark? Good. How are you? Good. You're listening and want to uh, respond to Shannon? Yeah. You know, I've, I've heard a lot of this, and it's just there's so much misinformation out there. This isn't about data entry. This isn't about not being able to strike. We haven't been able to strike since even prior to this law in 1983. Um, this is about the safety items that we have in our contract. We will no longer be able to have them nor negotiate them. And if you want an example of why we need them, look at Charleston, South Carolina. They killed nine firefighters down there in a furniture store. They were undertrained, understaffed, under-equipped. And if you complained about it, you got fired. And that's exactly what Governor Kasich wants here. It's, uh, you know, and that's wait, wait, he, he, want, he doesn't want people to be able to complain and be able to fire them. If you listen to his talking points, he if you don't like your job, you should be fired. And so if you, you come think, and complain wait a minute, about safety, Mark, do you think that's wrong? If you go and complain about safety, no, you should no, be no, no. Fired. You said if if you don't like your job and you go and complain, if, he you said he thinks you should be fired. Do you think that's wrong? Absolutely, I think you should be able to point out safety problems without the fear of uh, no. You said you and, said don't like you said don't like your job. Exactly, and that could be construed a lot of different ways. If you go in, well, that's why I'm asking about, you to clarify. You said originally, "Don't like your job." Do you mean only complaining about safety, or or other things as well? Anything that could affect your safety, you know, whatever. Yes. So you're only talking about safety then, and uh, complaining uh, about a safety issue. Yes, and, and I'm sure there's other areas too. But if you listen to what Governor Kasich wants, he wants to keep complete control over. You don't like what's going on? Fine. We'll get rid of you. We'll get somebody else. And that's what they do in Charleston, South Carolina. And it, it affects the citizens, ultimately. You know, they, they're, they don't know how trained we are. They don't know what kind of staffing. And, it, you know, as far as we need to take cuts, everything else, we have adjusted. We are doing more with less. We're closing fire companies every day. Um, our attrition, we're down about 70 people over the last year. Um, we're closing up to 10% of our fire companies, and it'll get to 15 or 20% in the summer. Mark, so Mark hang, hang on one second, though. I, I, I hate when any public union rep talks about it being safety or about the citizens, because for them, it is about the union. You are representing the union. You're doing everything you can for the firefighters, not for the people necessarily. Exactly, but our safety allows us to go deeper into a fire. It allows us to respond quicker it allows us to, to go into the fire quicker. If you show up with one or two people on a fire truck, yeah, the citizens see a fire truck. But guess what? You can't do anything. There's standards and laws out there unless they change those or unless they make you go in with, with one person or why whatever. Should, why, but what, here's what I understand. Why should you be held to any different standard than the rest of the world, those of us who don't work in the public sector? A different standard in what way? Well, you say, well, you know, I should be able to complain about my company, or if I have a safety concern, I shouldn't be concerned about uh, expressing it to somebody without fear of fire. The governor just wants ultimate control over these things. That's what the rest of us deal with every day, Mark. You have whistleblower protection. The, you, you don't have whistleblower protection without, the, without uh, collective bargaining. Who knows? There's so Who much knows? Stuff, right there. So Who right? No, no, right there. This, there's Who so much knows? Stuff buried in this bill no, you're coming at it as in you know there's no whistle, whistleblower protection. That's how you're presenting this. And the other thing is, Mark, you don't. You wouldn't have to work. No one said become a firefighter. Nobody said if the rules change, you have to continue to work in the state or or anywhere else. Okay, so you want to just bring in people with no safety standards, no, no training? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying you're coming at it as, as uh, representing individual firefighters or yourself, and the point is you can go to some other place. Exactly, and if that's the attitude they want, then you think that's going to bring business in? Shannon Jones has yet to say how much money this bill is going to cost 
or whether or how much it's going to save or whether it's going to save any money. You don't think it would save money to cut down on retiree benefits? That's a whole separate issue. The retiree benefits are being cut. We're going to pay an extra 2.25%. The benefits are cut. That's a whole a whole other bill that's going through. That has nothing to do with this bill going through. Mark, I would love to keep you more and talk. I've, I've got to skate, though. I've got some uh, commercials. If you want to schedule some more time, we'll uh, set it up. I, I just didn't realize you were going to call in today, and we could talk to you a little bit more. All right. Thank All you, right. Man. Thank you so much. Right. It's Mark Monahan from the Firefighters Union. Doc Thompson, 700 WL. All right. It's horrible when a community has to go through something like this. No, it's difficult. It makes the school look bad. Everybody has to worry about what's going on. It's just not a good situation in general, regardless of how you feel about the teacher, what she should be charged with, whether or not your your kids were involved, and if that would be a problem for you, how you talk. Aside from all that, this is not a good situation. But we may have a way we can turn this negative into a positive. Well, we're having trouble right now with schools all across the country. How do we get education up? How How do we increase the level of learning, understanding, and graduation? And... How do we fund it? Man, we are broke. We come out with, and and I think we could lead the nation, a teachers of the tri-state calendar. We scour the tri-state for the hottest teachers out there. One a month. Maybe then we go ahead and do a teachers gone wild video. Yeah. We advertise it late night. It's on all the time, running overnight. Teachers gone wild. Showing a little bit of skin, a little provocative attitude. Not a whole lot because you got to buy the DVD. Then then we're able to go ahead and fund some of these school projects. Teachers of the Tri-State Calendar. A Teachers Gone Wild video. Maybe in the schools, in the local school newspapers, a swimsuit, a teacher's swimsuit edition. You wouldn't suddenly be interested in the school newspaper? That's right. We all would. Schools are making money. We have to put less towards it. Now, if you couple this, this whole idea, with school choice, I think you got a winner. Oh, yeah. What school is your kid going to want to go to? The one where the teacher is sleeping with the students or not? You run home. Guess Guess what Mrs. McMurtry gives for an A? Yeah, let them earn their grades. Now, what it is, it's an incentive. Sure. You do a really good job, get an A. Kids will be begging to go to school. They'll run to school, which could solve some of Lakota's busing troubles. Yeah, they're not worried about getting a ride. If they know they have a possibility of seeing one of the teachers naked at school, they understand that Mrs. McMurtry is willing to do something like that. Oh, you don't have to worry about driving them. You don't have to worry about getting them up in the morning, setting an alarm clock. You'll get up and you're, where the hell's Pete? Oh, he left early for school today. There's a kid who wants to learn. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Think about the changes in the interview process in the future in schools. Now they're looking for teachers. There'll have to be some changes. And the principals say something like, hmm, I see you graduated from the top of your class at Harvard But I'm not so sure. Hmm. Well, I worked as a stripper one summer. Hired! A lot of changes, a lot of adjustments, but maybe we can turn this into a positive. Cut down on school funding and encourage kids to learn. It's Doc Thompson, home of the Reds, 700 WLW. We're going to do a little more on Senate Bill 5 and what this means to you. You, the employer of the people who work in the public sector in the state of Ohio. Now, I have people going crazy on email. Doc hates firefighters and cops. Doc hates teachers. All of these things. I don't hate any of them. I just want you to be reasonable. I want you to understand that the rest of us, the rest of the world does not operate in a bubble like you do, where you can simply claim anything you want. And as long as you have those union reps who are really not in it for the people or safety or the students or the average person out there, they're in it for the union members. When you become reasonable and recognize we are broke, then we'll all be better off. And you can continue to negotiate these outrageous retirements where in some cases you don't pay anything into it. You get these sweetheart deals. That's fine. But guess what? The well is running out. There's no more money. Where do you expect us to get it? Tax ourselves? 
more. Those of us who are, in many cases, unemployed. Those of us who are battling right now with higher prices across the board. Those of us who have more and more money going out to all kinds of things in taxes. The consideration that we may have to raise taxes to pay off past debts and sins. That's the problem. You live in a bubble. And the rest of us are your employer, and we don't live in a bubble. If you want to comment on Senate Bill 5 or any of the ideas of uh, public workers' unions, 513-749-7800, the big one. Right now, joining me on the phone is the head of the Tenth Amendment Party. I want to bring back the Nullification Act, Michael Bolden. You got it, Doc. Good to be here. TenthAmendmentCenter.com. Oh, uh-huh. Michael Bolden. You're no relation to the singer, right? Well, you know, I I only sing in the shower. (laughs) As soon as I heard that, all I could think of was office space. I mean, people. (laughs) My my hair isn't as long, you know. You must really like his music. What with having a similar name at all? (laughs) No, he really likes the Tenth Amendment. Oh, is that what it is? Similar name to mine. Yeah, exactly. All right, tell me about the Ten the uh, the Nullification Act. First of all, what is the Nullification Act? Nullification is Thomas Jefferson's answer to the essential question. When the federal government violates the rules that have been given to it, the Constitution, what do we do about it? Do we go to Washington, D.C. and march on D.C. and ask the federal government to limit its, limit its own powers? Do we go to federal courts and ask the federal judges to limit federal powers? Do we vote bums out and hope that the new bums come in and say, oh, well, we don't want all this power that you've given us? No, Thomas Jefferson specifically told us back in 1798 that any time the federal government assumes undelegated powers, quote, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy. And what he meant was that your state is supposed to pass laws and resolutions to reject and to make null and void a certain federal act. And there are many states around the country, 11 right now, that are considering nullification of the federal uh, federal uh, health care act or law that was passed uh, last year to reject every single word of it, for example. So how would this whole thing play out? They would all, uh, anybody who doesn't want, any state that doesn't want to be affected by an overreaching federal government, they would just have the, they would pass a law that says we are exempt from, from that. Yeah, is is that essentially yeah. what you mean by n- nullification? Yeah, essentially, or you could do what the state of Arizona did, for example, this last fall on medical marijuana, of all things. They basically said, we don't care that the the Supreme Court has ruled that it's illegal, and Congress says that it's illegal, we're going to do it anyway. And state Arizona is kind of a state's rights hotbed that kind of fit right into what they do. And it, that's a good example of showing that this goes across the political spectrum. The idea is that we want to keep the most difficult and divisive issues where they belong, close to home in our states. Wouldn't we just see if the states um, start uh, passing their own legislation that says, listen, we're exempt from this, you know, as part of this idea of nullification. Wouldn't we just see the federal government then try to exert its power and say, listen, you have to fall in line and then just lawsuits to challenge up to the Supreme Court, kind of like we've seen in the, the Obamacare well, that's what people fear, but the reality is, is back in 2007, uh, 25 states, well, from 2007 until recently, 25 states have rejected the Real ID Act of 2005, mm. and the federal government has had those threats. They've threatened to take funds. They've threatened people saying that, oh, you know, you're not going to be able to get on planes. Then what's been the result? Well, we're all still getting on planes. It may be a little difficult. And the the governor of uh, Montana famously said, you know, the way we deal with that, we just tell D.C. to go to hell. And he said that in an NPR interview. So when enough states and enough people reject Washington, D.C. and their unconstitutional mandates, there's not much that D.C. can do about it. So really, the federal government uh, isn't always going to try to enforce something that they passed. Well, they're, they're probably always going to try to, but I think there's some political realities. And when you've got two dozen states saying no to it, it's going to be pretty difficult for them to, to smash everything through. So the reality is, is we, the people of the several states, well, we created the federal government and not the other way around. So it's time we start acting like it. I'm certainly in, in favor of trying to get the powers back in balance. The, the, the original system was that we would have a balance between the people the states and the federal government and it was a genius system it all got out of whack long about uh 19 16 17 somewhere in there when they repealed this or created the 17th amendment i don't think we could ever repeal that that's it just is a marketing disaster so something like nullification may bring the powers back in line sure sure and this is all about returning the system to where the founders created it to be 
in the hands of people, local self-government is the way the system is supposed to work under a big defense umbrella to deal with just certain major things that are delegated to the federal government of the Constitution, you know, foreign policy, uh, the post offices, post roads, just very basic things. Have you heard of, and I like the idea of nullification, it, I'm certainly willing to put in the time, and I think states should, you know, if, if they're doing the right thing, but it seems pretty pretty involved and pretty busy because you'd have to target each and everything the federal government did as opposed to have you heard of the repeal amendment that some states are working on i have but the, what what the problem is that i have with the repeal amendment is that you're going to require to get two-thirds or three-quarters of the rest of the states mm. to get on board and the reality is if you're doing something that's right you should do what's right whether you're the only person on earth doing what's right or if you've got a majority with you and nullification allows a single state to do what's right, no matter whether or not the other states are all doing something wrong. Now, there are broader nullification bills. In Arizona and Montana, for example, they're considering uh, creating a, a constitutional committee of sorts where they're going to review basically everything coming out of Washington, wow. D.C. and make rec- recommendations to the state on how to reject or deal with those things. I don't know how far along Ohio is on that. I know, for example, there's the, uh, the Health Care Freedom Amendment to deal with just the Obamacare mandates. But that's all a step in the right direction, bringing these issues closer to home. Let the people of Ohio decide, not California or West Virginia or somebody else decide for Ohio. I certainly like that idea. I know Montana had one that they were battling out, um, I think, with the Second Amendment. Virginia has a cap and tax one they're working on now. And there's a lot of states with Obamacare that are challenging that. Sure, sure. And then we have to keep in mind, for people on the left, there are now 15 states that have flat-out rejected Washington, D.C.'s laws and the Supreme Court on medical marijuana. So whatever your, mm. your viewpoint is on that particular thing, we actually have a blueprint that says, okay, well, you know, just do what you want to do in your own state and get other people on board, and you're going to be able to make things happen for what you believe. And this is all the kind of thing that we're talking about. Uh, we're holding an event right there in Cincinnati on March 5th called Nullify Now, and people can learn more about this by going to nullifynow.com to, uh, to get information on the event and uh, get some education. All right. Well, I'll put a link to it as well so people can get more information. What day of the week is, uh, is March 5th? That's a Saturday. All right. I'm going to do my best to actually be there at the uh, event. I want to learn more on it as well. I know um, the red carpet is already rolled out for you. Oh, so excellent. Very <laughs> good. I expect it. the limo, you know, the whole treatment. You now, know it. And I just want to go and observe and, and, and learn. I, I like going to these events because there's a lot of great information that's provided. I know with the medical marijuana, well, marijuana, period, has been something that the federal government keeps threatening the states over, but they really haven't challenged um, anything significantly anyways, any significant challenges to the states that have passed some sort of medical marijuana use or, or lessen the criminal uh, punishments? Well, it's very difficult for them. I mean, when, when it was first California, where I'm from back in the 90s, it was a lot easier because it was one state going it alone. But as more and more states got on board, and like I mentioned, there are now 15 most recently Arizona, it becomes very difficult. They just get overwhelmed with the, uh, the enforcement of it, and they had to admit that, look, we can't use the resources. We don't have them. Now, we should apply that to our gun rights. We should apply that to our health freedom. We should apply that to just about everything else, and uh, maybe we'll have a little freer country. I like it. All right, Michael Bolden, head of the Tenth Amendment Party on nullification. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks, Doc. And there, of course, is a link at 700WLW.com. My blog there brought to you by the American Trading Company. All right, we'll come back and uh, talk a little bit more about Senate Bill 5 and unions in the state of Ohio. It's Doc Thompson, 700WLW. Fox 19 Storm Tracker forecast for meteorologist Frank Marzullo. You got some sunshine this afternoon. Breezy, a high near 44. Partly cloudy tonight, overnight low 24. Sunshine and warmer tomorrow with a high near 48. Right now at the big one, it's 40. I don't understand. Why this is such a difficult concept. Why it is so difficult. I don't understand why people can't understand that we are broke. We don't have the money. We're out. We're done. And yes, I know it's not fun to face the prospect that you may lose some of your salary or lose your job. I've been there. It's not fun. But the entire country is going through that in the private sector. Meanwhile, generally speaking... Across the board, the public sector has grown. The federal workers have just mushroom-clouded over the last couple of years. Grown exponentially. 
We don't have the money. Who's paying those salaries? A lot of us in the private sector who don't have the jobs. Mismanagement and misspending for years. And we are your employers, whether you like it or not. We are your employers. And it's up to employers to decide whether or not there are funds available. If there aren't funds available, then we've got to make changes. And when you union reps call in, you're not representing the people or safety. That's been your marketing ploy for years. When it comes to teachers, we care about education and the children. No, you don't. You care about the union and the union members. That's your power base and that's your money. And for you public service or safety workers, union reps, you don't care about public safety and you don't care about the average person out there. You're not worried about crime statistics or fire statistics. You're union worried about your union. Now, many of the people that work in those sectors who belong to those unions are good, hardworking people who understand the problems with the unions, who understand the downside of the unions, and who understand that the unions are only in it for themselves. I don't want to see you lose your job. I don't hate you. I think you do a good job, and I think if you do a good job, you ought to make good money. But we can't continue with this idea of things like tenure, where bad people are propped up, or they cont- you continue to pad certain positions, pad hours, All in the name of getting more for the worker. The private sector doesn't do that. We can't. Take some calls now. 513-749-7000. Let's go to Joe. Uh, Did I get the wrong one? There you go. Joe on a cell phone. You're on 700 WLW. Hi, Doc. How Um, you doing? uh, Pretty good. Hey, I was around uh, prior to the institution of the collective bargaining bill. I was... uh, uh, deputy sheriff in Franklin County, and um, and I kind of know why some of that came about. Um, I you know, and, and I also understand what's going on now. I'm not I've not got my head in a bucket. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so um, when it started out, when the collective bargaining bill started out, it was. Uh, somewhat of a protection thing because uh, at that time, uh, prior to that, sheriffs could do pretty much whatever they wanted. They had the old uh, flower funds that you were expected to kick back. I don't know how much percent of uh, you mean if you were paid- if you were a deputy. You mean yes, okay. yeah, and and so many other of the county employees mm-hmm. or county office holders did the same thing. Well, with the institution of the collective bargaining bill, I think they they outlawed that pretty much. Um, then, uh, prior to that, the county commissioners would say, all right, Sheriff, here's how much money you got, and you can do with it whatever you want to do. You can give it, and if in, if, in effect, you could give it to pay raises to some people and not to others, that's your, that's your prerogative. So... Um, Consequently, then it gave gave uh, the people the right, or the the employees the right to negotiate their pay wages or pay stuff with directly with the county commissioners, so that the sheriff couldn't say, "Well, you know, I've only got this much to give, so that's all you get." You know what I mean? Okay. What I don't understand, though, the the two scenarios you've laid out: if a sheriff's getting kickbacks, they could have simply outlawed that, and if a sheriff well, violates it, then you. You bust them. Yeah, well, they did that, but they did that to all county office holders, too. Well, or I, all officers, supposedly. Well, okay? I understand that, but I mean, now you're talking about something that is really isn't about unions or safety or anything like that. You're talking about a, a structure where if a sheriff was saying, you got to give me kickbacks or whatever, uh, uh, pass a law that says they can't do that. It doesn't have to necessarily come as part of collective bargaining. If it comes down to sheriffs, as you say, having a budget and then they could spend them how they, the money how they want, I don't see the problem in that. If, if, you, if you in a county, you say, okay, our sheriff, he, we give him a million dollars a year to hire what would be X number of sheriff's deputies and whatever, but he chooses to pay all of them double and hire half as many. Well, you as a citizen can say, I have trouble with that because we're not being protected. 
We want more sheriff's deputies on the roads investigating. We, we need more out there. So then you fire your sheriff. I, I don't understand why that's such a, a difficult concept. Or if in a county you say, wow, the sheriff is, um, is paying people really well. Crime's down. I don't have a whole lot of complaints. Maybe they should get a little bit more. I mean, that comes down to the free market principle. The rest of us have to deal with that. You go into an employer. They say, here's what the job pays. You negotiate back and forth, and you say, I'd like a little bit more. They'd say, we don't have any more. Or maybe they say, fine. Are you that valuable? Why, why should we treat the private sector or the public sector any different than the private sector? Why don't we approach it that way? All it does, if you don't, is give us what we've gotten for so long. Bloated budgets and public workers you can't fire even if they are horrible. That's what it's gotten us. So what's wrong with the change? To give people the flexibility, local government, state government, to say, I'm not going to be beholden to a collective bargaining agreement. Instead, I'll be negotiating with you. We think you could do a good job. We want to hire you. Here's what we have to spend. Do you want the job? Okay. You don't? Okay, we'll look somewhere else. More of your calls next. 700 WL. Willie really has me intrigued. 133 today. He's going to talk about a scandal in Reading. Something is brewing in Reading, and Willie's going to talk about it at 133 today, right here on 700 WLW. A couple of quick calls in here. Let's get to Donnie Kenwood. You're on 700 WLW. Hey, Doc, for, for you to be making comments that there's people out there that are in the uh, public service uh, uh, scenarios that don't care about their jobs, uh, you know, I take offense to that, being a firefighter myself. Um, there are times that uh, you, you, the general public have no idea what we do. All they think is that we wash the pretty fire trucks, we eat, and every now and then we put out a fire, we start an IV. For those of you that are making comments like that, you have absolutely no clue what firemen do on a daily basis. I said the I said the union reps do not care about the job or the people. They care about the union. And then I went on to say that many employees in the public sector, whether it's firemen or cops or, or teachers, do care about it and do a good job. But we have to be realistic. We're broke. Pretty Did you? Broke. Ohio, the federal government, we're broke. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's true. Ohio is broke. So the Fed, thank God. But, you know, there, there are actual people out here who do care about our positions. And, and there's a lot of, I mean, the general public really truly don't have a clue as to what, what firemen do. My eight hour day consists of checking my truck to make sure nothing's broke on a first, make sure my gear is up and running. So if we do have an emergency, we can get to it in the prompt manner. And then we have the, the people out there that want to race us and or pull out in front of us. And then it's our fault because we can't slow down the, the, the rig quick enough that we rear in them. Uh, you know, that, that gets irritating time at the time at the time. And then those are the same individuals that want to cry because we're not there fast enough for them when they call 911. The problem is, Donnie, is it, it, it really comes down to the union. I think most people respect what firefighters and cops and teachers do. It's the unrealistic expectations when it comes to bargaining that, unfortunately, in, in many cases, the outrageous retirements have added to the problems we're in right now. Did you, did you support the bailing out of General Motors and Chrysler? No, I did not. Okay, then why would you continue to support the, um, the collective bargaining agreements that allows people to get outrageous, what I consider outrageous retirements? What do you consider that to be outrageous with what we do? No, no, no. Why would you support that? Because of the job I do. At any given time, if I push a, a, the wrong button on what I do, I can shock another crew member if I'm defibrillating a patient. So the, you push a wrong Hold on. You push a wrong button, you go to commercial early. No, no, no. Uh, no, no so, I'm, so the difference between the General Motors bailout and us continuing to fund what I consider outrageously um, unions and union members because of collective bargaining, the difference is because your job is more dangerous. I think it's a whole lot more dangerous. Don't you agree? No, I do in many cases, but I'm guessing if you're working the punch press at a uh, General Motors plant, that can be fairly dangerous to you, to people that you work with as well. It could be if you don't take the proper measures. Right, I'm saying so those jobs can be quite dangerous as well. And, and to be honest, you know, the, the, the uh, retirement we pay into doesn't go into the state. We've got our own retirement. We don't pay into 
stay retirement. No, I understand that. And why? Why? So then, why do public employees have a different retirement? That I can't answer. I have no idea. Hopefully, because it's protected. As opposed to Social Security, why? Why wouldn't you just be on Social Security? I don't get. Well, I don't get Social Security. I don't pay into it. No, no. I'm saying, why? Are you in favor of it being separate, or, or would you be okay with us saying, let's put everybody on Social Security? No, I'm all right with it being separate. Why is that? Because it's my money. That way, I, I can protect my money. Well, Social Security would protect your money, wouldn't it? Mm, not, not, not as far as I can tell. I mean, the, the Fed, uh, along with the Fed and state uh, uh, reps, I think they're going to just screw that all up for everybody in the future. I mean, so, they're trying their damnedest now, and they have tried very hard in the past. So you recognize the, the public retirement program is better than Social Security? Sure, I think it is. Okay. So why would you have a, one that is better than everybody else? Because I'm the one that's paying into mine. We pay into ours. Well, uh, but uh, why, why would you want to take away? I mean, if you no, 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 Donnie. Hang, hang on a second. No, I asked, why would you want to have a better system than everybody else out there? If I can better for myself and for my brothers, why not? So you're just in it for yourself? No, I'm in it for everybody that works in the, in the fire service and the police service. But everybody else, be damned. No, not be damned. Social Security is going to be there for them. No, you just said that yours is better. I did not say that. No, you said, you know, that is exactly. You if said we, you would rather be in your it, system. If we pay into it, if we have a board of electors that oversees our money and what we do with it, uh-huh. that's fine. Right, but you don't want to go on Social Security. You recognize yours is a better system. Sure it is, and if I put my 30 years in... Okay, so sure, no, no, so, okay, so there it is. You have now recognized that yours is a better system. Why, why shouldn't we all have the better system? Because we all have a put in the time that I have and that other fire. No, no, no. That is no, Donnie. That's incorrect. There are many people on Social Security who put on time and they're uh, past the age of retirement. We all pay into the system. Yours is just a better system. Why do you think you should have a better system? Because I just think that I'm entitled to it because of the job I do. And there's like nobody said, there's nobody else out there that does a job just as valuable and important or dangerous as you. Police and the firemen. No, I, I mean that are in the private sector. No. So you recognize your job is more important and more dangerous than anybody else, and therefore you're entitled, your word, to a better yes. system. Yes. Because you know what? When something goes bad at their job, who do they call? They call me. Correct? If something goes bad at the radio station, who do you call? You don't call the local this guy to take care of it, do you? You call 911. Guess who responds? I do. And therefore, hold on, hold on. therefore, up in the middle of the night at your house, who do you call? You call local 911, hoping that mm-hmm. your cop shows up, mm-hmm. right? And, and nobody else has important jobs out there. I didn't say their jobs were important. Mm-hmm. I'm simply mm-hmm. telling you, we mm-hmm. support everybody else around us, both commercial and residential. When something goes bad, they call upon us. No, Donnie, I think you laid it out quite nicely when you said you're entitled. I, I believe I am, just like you feel like you're entitled. To exactly. You are entitled because you think your job is most important and most dangerous. I'm not putting myself on, comp- uh, comp- on the same level as yours, but there are plenty of people out there in the private sector who do incredibly important jobs and dangerous jobs. But you think you're entitled. I've told you, I think police, firefighters, and teachers do a great job. They do a great service. But more important than everybody else? You really think that? You're entitled? That's the problem. That's the bubble you live in. That's it right there. Mark Sanders from the Ohio Professional Firefighters Association. Hello, Mark. Hi, Doc. How you doing? I, I got to get out of my bubble here. Hang on one second. Do you think here firefighters are entitled? Look, I'm... You know, <laughs> Here's what I think firefighters are entitled to, an opportunity to sit down and discuss workplace issues with our employer without, as you had Mark Monahan on today from Cincinnati, without the threats of reprisal or anything like that, because, you know, that has worked. It's worked for over 28 years. No, it hasn't worked. Well, I I think it has worked. No, we're running out of money, Mark. We don't have any. And part of the problem is the retirements of public workers. Well, we'll go to retirement here in a second. Let's talk about collective bargaining. You know, collective bargaining, I think, and some some would say, has saved money for the citizens. There's there's several things in this bill that take away our ability to save money for uh, communities. I mean, 
here, it's shown that in 1983 to now, uh, at this level in 2011, there's the same amount of state workers. That's what I heard uh, last week at a hearing. Employees have not gone up. Sure, wages have gone up just like everybody else's. There has been no uh, no work stoppages uh, for the last uh, 28 years with the, the safety forces. Ohio led the nation. I'm not condoning that. We certainly do not want to strike. We don't have the ability to strike. We did not have the ability to strike then. But when conditions erode to where uh, committed police and firefighters have to hit the street and let the public know, they talk about transparency, unfortunately the transparency uh, becomes all too clear when we reach that level. We put ourselves in a very uh, bad, precarious position. Now, why, what I don't understand when you say collective bargaining, why can't a cop or a firefighter or a teacher, well, upon I- employment, you know, when they're getting hired, say, this is what I want to make and work out their own deal? Well, I think, come on, Doc, uh, you know, you, that, that's not doable. Um, why is that not doable? People do it every day. I did it. Everyone else does it. Senator Jones talks about transparency. No, no, no. Why is that not doable? It is not doable. I'm it asking is, you why. In our world, it is not. So I just, I just leave it at that. No, no, no. You can't leave it at that. Why, tell me I, why it is not doable. They talk about transparency. No, no, Mark. Why are you leaving Every, it that? This is your. Uh, hold on a second, Mark. Hold on. Listen, listen, this is no, no. This is your opportunity to set make, it straight. Everything we make is public record. Okay. You talk about big union bosses, and you want to pit against public employees and unions. So there you go. Union bosses You're, like myself. I, I. I get off a fire truck and drive to Columbus. I work with everybody uh, that has a stake in this. So when I say it's not doable, it's not doable because there's a process. There are professionals at a table that answer to the public. Uh, I, as a, an employee and an employer in a jurisdiction like Cincinnati, they have representatives that answer to the public. They're called city council. And they so- bring people into a room and make it a professional work process where you come out at the end with an agreement and and in our profession that is certainly how it should be done okay Uh, now but you you just told us the process which i think most of us have a general idea of but you still haven't said why you couldn't do it as individuals like the rest of the world well because here first of all i know that you hit this earlier with mark bonnie and we are not providing some of the same opportunities that a that you are in the private sector. As a public employee, I can't speak out about uh, the issues that go on in our workplace. Uh, so you, th- you, think, you think I can? You, th- about- you think I can, Mark? You think what? I could go out on the street and tell Not, you some of the gory details of things going on? I think maybe you ought to be a firefighter then. And then maybe you ought to see how important when Senator Jones says she has skin in the game. I'll show you who's got skin in the game. There you go, Mark. Lowest common denominator. Lowest common denominator to go to the dangerous job. Something that nobody has ever said you don't have a dangerous job. Look, You always resort to that instead of giving me the details. I asked you some direct questions, and you still haven't said why you can't simply negotiate like everybody else. And what did you resort to? Do the fact that all of us know that firefighters do a dangerous do job. Like Here, public employees, and if they're going to outlaw the ability of public employees to uh, join a union or organize themselves to uh, work for the working conditions, you as a private sector employee have that choice. You're protected by the federal government to make that choice. If you choose not to, that's fine. What they're trying to do is eliminate our, our ability to even make that choice. You, don't, you can so, make the choice not to be a firefighter. Well, Certainly. I certainly can. But you know what? When I make that choice to be a firefighter, there's a process in place to make sure that, one, we are not on the street, uh, two, and that my family is protected. When I make that ultimate commitment, uh, I certainly don't want, wor- don't want to be worried about work rules and the other things that are going on in the workplace. I have to be ready, fully trained, fully equipped, and this law would take that away from us, the ability to sit down and do that. We'd be still fighting fires in uh, hip boots and uh, uh, dungaree jackets. So, you know, this has brought on good positive change for the citizens, in my mind. And I I certainly uh, can show you example after example, especially in the last two years of uh, no wage increases. I would say all fire departments, the majority, but a few, are the same level or less employees, probably in most part less 
employees than they had in 1983. So the system does work. It does bear to the uh, economic times. And you still have not given me a reason why you couldn't do it as individuals like the private sector. Well, there are many places in the private sector that, is, that they don't do it as individuals. They come together with the ability to choose. And if they don't, the different the difference is they will have to deal with the consequences, or should, like when they are not being reasonable about what a company makes, like General Motors, and can no longer compete, except we stupidly bailed them out. Well, what I should happen that in those situations is, is the free, is the free, is the free market, you're not going to argue what? I'm not going to argue that the government is getting, government is getting paid back by General Motors. No, they're think, not. Uh, do you, do you, do you want do you want to know about General Motors? The fact is, they offered their initial. No, no, hold on a second, Mark. Hold on. No, no, I want to set the record straight because you're just being. No, you're just being pro union and you're being blind. You're not being reasonable to what's going on in the world. No, I'm being pro firefighter. No, you're not. That's always the excuse that you use, and what you're really being is pro union. And I'm there's a difference. I am pro firefighter, pro cop, and pro teacher. You are pro union because you're being unreasonable. Why are you upset? See, that's the problem. Why are you upset, upset, Mark? Is that it? it? You're really going to play that game now? I'm upset because you are being unreasonable and don't realize that America and the state of Ohio is going down the tubes. We don't have the money to pay for you, and you continue to play these little union games. I think that the state workers just put in... uh, Why aren't you upset, Mark? How come Uh, you're not upset? uh, Hey, look, because, you know, it's a process. The legislative uh, system is a process. Uh, people get upset, and you don't come to good solutions. And that's what collective bargaining does, especially for firefighters and police. Mm-hmm. It lets you resolve workplace issues in the proper place, and not not uh, as an individual when you get in hired. Yes, I understand. You and not and not in the mm-hmm. Yes, uh, I understand. You know, I mean, here, I I just got a question for you. I want to make sure I'm talking to an Ohio resident, the taxpayer. I mean, I know you're a taxpayer, but are you still uh, commuting from Virginia or? You know, how come you haven't chosen to come back to Ohio and live here? Do you think I don't live in Ohio? Well, I, I just believe what I, I guess I shouldn't believe what I read in the paper here uh, on the radio. Obviously, you're not listening to the radio. Sure, I, I listen to the radio. I listen to you, Doc. I listen, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I, mm-hmm. I love Willie Cunningham. Mm-hmm. He's very entertaining. Mm-hmm. I, have, I, have a, I have a house in Claremont County. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see you're here. But I, but I, but I, I see what you're doing there. I want everybody to realize what's going on. So instead of talking about the issues, you're attacking me personally now. No, Trying no, no, to, no, 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 don't give me no, that garbage, Mark. No, what, I know exactly what, what you're doing. Do no, no, hold on a second. No, hold on a second. No, hold on a second. Hold on. Hold on a second. What you're doing is playing a little game trying to spin this and put it back on me like I'm not a resident here. Really? That's what you want to do? That's what collective bargaining is about? Just, That's no. a baloney game, no. and everybody just saw through Come it. Come on, Doc. Come on, Doc. No, you everybody know knows exactly what you're doing. Uh, I know what I'm doing, too. When I, I was just curious. For those you were just curious, really? That I saw. How, yeah. is, how is that relevant? How is that relevant? Because I'm so hopeful. I couldn't, I couldn't ask you difficult questions that, while I'm representing the station? Listen, listen to me. I, I'm hopeful that mm-hmm. if you're on the radio and mm-hmm. you take these positions uh-huh. and we discuss mm-hmm. the issues that are going to be done in the legislature, mm-hmm. that you are, re- you know, that you're a resident of Ohio, hopefully a, a registered voter. Mm-hmm. So at least mm-hmm. I know who I'm talking to and not somebody from out of state about our issues here in Ohio. Doc. No, that's, that's why I asked the question. No, that's baloney, that's Mark, I and I appreciate it. And on that, I'm going to let you go. All Mark right, Sanders from the Ohio Thanks. Professional right, Firefighters Association. That was a little game he was playing to try to put me in my place. That's what he was working on there. The fact is, even if I wasn't a resident, how many people listening right now are residents? That was a little game he was playing. He played the union game and tried to say me and my family and how dangerous it is for firefighters, something we all recognize, and to try to put me in my place. I'm pro-firefighter, I'm pro-cop, and I'm pro-teacher. He and the others are merely pro-union. Doc Thompson, 700 WLW. Doc Thompson on 700 WLW. Oh, yeah. All right, we're uh, running late, but I want to get a bunch of quick calls in here. Let's get uh, Dave in Springdale. You're on 700 WLW. Yeah, Doc, what you fail to realize, I'm, not, I'm non-union, but uh, you fail to realize that this is a collective bargaining agreement, mm-hmm. an agreement between two parties. They came to an agreement. 
If you can't live up to your agreement, then why did they agree to it? Why did they sign the contract? Well, as I, as I pointed out with uh, the representative from the Firefighters Union in Ohio and also the other guy, because what happens is they play little games, Dave, little marketing games, and they pr- try to pretend that it's really about, when it comes to the union people, that it's really about the children or safety, and it's not for the union people. For the union people, it is about the union their power, and their money. There's the difference. Yes, it's an agreement. Unfortunately, why don't they just simply say, here's what we are willing to pay. Take it or leave it. You want to be a cop, a firefighter, a teacher? Here's what we have in our local community. If you don't want that, you don't have to be a cop, a firefighter, a teacher. Just like if you don't want that, you don't have to be a lumberjack or a talk show host or anybody else. Collective bargaining is about the union and that power. And it's not about safety or the kids. More your calls on the way. 700 WLW. How come you can't just be honest? How come you can't lay it out there? I'm being honest. I'm, I'm playing it straight here. I believe if you do a job, I don't care what that job is. From the job that seems or is stereotypically a lowly job cleaning up after people, garbage worker, whatever, that you should take pride in what you do and you should be respected for doing a good job. If you're a cop or a firefighter or a teacher, good for you. You've chosen that path. And I admit, those are difficult jobs and often dangerous. But there are many dangerous jobs in the private sector, and many important jobs in the private sector as well. I'm not putting myself into that class. But there are many people who have dangerous and important jobs. Jobs that affect a lot of people. I just want you to be honest about it. You live in a bubble quite often if you're part of a union with these collective bargaining agreements. They protect bad employees. We know that. We've known that the jokes have been around for years about union workers and bad employees. I believe in merit-based pay. And not on the collective merit, but on the individual merit. That you have a choice to make. What career path are you going to choose? Have you chosen firefighter, police officer, or teacher? Fine. Set out to make your fortune and make a difference in the world. Apply for positions that are open and negotiate the terms of your contract individually. How is that a bad thing? How is that wrong? To say as an individual, you are going to stand on your merits and not the merits of the collective. That just simply keeps the dead wood afloat. I want you to do well. Are you an exceptional employee? Are you an exceptional teacher, firefighter, or cop? Then you ought to be treated as such. Your salary ought to be represented as such. But how can you tolerate the bad cops, the bad firefighters, and the bad teachers? You know that's what happens. You know the conversations you have with your fellow employees about those employees who aren't doing the job. You know it. I know it because it happens everywhere. And in a union situation, it simply allows that to happen more. Collective bargaining, it's ridiculous. So far, two union reps and many employee or many union members still cannot tell me why we can't simply base it on an individual's contract. Here's what this city or local municipality has to spend on a firefighter, a cop, or a teacher. Do you want the job? Here are the benefits that come with it. What is the benefit of collective bargaining? Protecting your job? Why does your job need protected if you are doing a good job? Those are the realities that the rest of us have to face every day. Those of us in the private sector. Got an email from ML. 
Subject, firefighters, what a load. All the firefighters in our area are volunteer. They do the same job for free or nominal compensation. Thanks. John checked in. He said, I worked for the state of Ohio in the 70s. We had no union. We filled out an app. They told us what they paid, and either we took the job or not. It should be that way again. I understand those are dangerous jobs, far more dangerous than mine. I'm not putting myself into that category. But there are lots of jobs out there that are dangerous. Police officer and firefighter do not make the top 10 list of most dangerous jobs in America. I'm not discounting what they do, but let's put it into perspective. Number one on the list, 129 fatalities per 100,000 workers. Reported injury, 61 per 100,000 workers. And the salary, on average, just $28,000 a year. That job, fisherman. Number two on the most dangerous list, logger. You know how dangerous logging is? You fall off that log, get trapped underneath, you're gone. Pinched between the logs, you're done. Trees falling on you, the widow makers, the limbs falling down on people. 116,000, or 116 fatalities per 100,000 workers. Loggers, number two. Number three, farmers and ranchers. Number four, structural construction workers. Number five, sanitation workers. Number five on the list of most dangerous jobs. Number six, airline pilot with fatalities, 72 per 100,000. Number seven, roofer. Number eight, coal miner. Number nine, merchant mariner. Number 10, Miller, with 12 fatalities per 100,000. Number 11, power line installer. Yes, you have a dangerous job, and yes, I respect it. But let's put it into perspective. You should stand on your merits and not the merit of the career or profession. You should stand on your merit and not on the merit of the profession. It's a respectable one. It's a dangerous one. But when you throw that out as part of your collective bargaining, like Mike Sa- Mark Sanders did, you're playing a game. You're marketing it to me. Instead of saying, that cop's a good one, and that one's not. That teacher's a good one, and that one's not. That firefighter is a good one, and that one is not. More of your calls. Let's get to uh, Doug in Oakley. You're on 700 WLW. Hey, Doc. This call won't take long. I just want to get a shout-out to you and tell you I appreciate what you do. And last week you mentioned being a realist. I, I think that's what puts you in the minority. I just don't think that folks that call, they really have done their homework. I don't really think they think past the first sentence or two of the phone call. And they really don't know what to say when you back them into a corner. Well, I appreciate the call, and I'll, I'll take that as a compliment, I think, Doug. Absolutely. Oh, okay. As a compliment. Right. Absolutely, yes. And, and, you know, and, you know, I've never called a radio show before. I've never talked to anyone before, but, you know, I just felt compelled to call this time because I've been listening steady for a couple of weeks, and, you know, I just, I'm surprised by some of the attitudes and some of the thought processes of some of the callers. I just don't know if they have a filter on the radio that, that they don't hear what you say. They turn it around, and they try to make it what they wanted to hear, and I just... You know, from a, another realist, I'm just out there to say I appreciate what you do. Like hey, listening. Thank you so much, Doug. I appreciate it. Um, when it comes to the trouble we're all in in the state of Ohio, $10 billion in debt, the federal government, $14 plus trillion plus in debt. Right now, that, that's what the, big, the president's budget released today. Where are we going to cut? They're talking about hundreds of, of billions of dollars, and it's not enough. We don't have the money. So we need to all work this out. The best way to do it is you to get paid based on your merit. And those people you know that are bad, not doing the job, they're taking you down. You're not lifting them up. They're taking you down. Tony, you're on 700 WLW. Yeah, Doc. Uh, good morning. morning. And uh, just wanted to uh, kind of give you my side of it. Uh, I've been on both sides of the year. I'm, I'm a combat veteran. Uh, come out of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan with a little bit more lead than I should have. And uh, thank you for serving, Tony. Private secretary and uh, worked for Department of Transportation here in Ohio for a few years. And uh, I've worked 
union on both sides. Worked for Goodyear Corporation before I went back into the military. I've, I've got about 22 years in the military altogether, and then I'm 55. So I went to the I went to work where there was work. Uh, whatever it took. I remember being laid off in the 80s uh, out of the coal mines. Cut firewood, took it to Columbus from down here, and sold firewood uh, to provide for my children, my family. And um, you talk about the unions, uh, especially collective bargaining here in Ohio. Uh, it's really, and I have to say this, and a lot of the employees you'll talk to is a joke. Because um, on the mean, uh, compared to union workers, which would be operating engineers, laborers, or whatever, we're basically about 40% less than that. But what a lot of people look at is a consistent job. Uh, starting out uh, in here at Department of Transportation in this county, basically about 29000 a year. Uh, the, the retirement is a lot different than it used to be, especially the health care. Uh, compared to when I worked before, uh, the health care we probably pay in about, in a period of five years, about 60% more, maybe 70% more according to what coverage you have than you did before. And then also uh, with that, um, you know, you have the type of work that you do, which it's really a professional work. You run backhoe, heavy equipment. You know, when you're hired into that job, there's a list about a page of what you're qualifying you know, requirements are to get that job. Class A CDL, tanker endorsement, all these things. And when you're hired, you're told you'll do from A to Z. You know, it's not one of these, you're going to drive a truck all the time. It's, it's everything. And when it comes to, like, contract time, uh, probably here in the state uh, over the last 10 years, there's a freeze on pay for three years, actually six years, and then there, that's just through the Department of Transportation. And then 1.5% uh, raise over three years. Then in the middle of that, there was a change that they want to stop the raises, not even any uh, yearly, uh, like for years of service, a lot of unions and different things, you'll get a step raise there. And so um, when it came bargaining time, basically there was no bargaining. They come to you, they said, here it is. You want your job, especially over the last nine years. You want your job, here it is, this is all we can do which, you know, everybody meaned up and took it. Uh, that's all you can do. Is that, is that wrong, though, Tony? No, no, oh, I okay. have no problem with that. I mean, we, we took the concessions. We knew there was problems because where it started to show up was in our funds for each county, actually each district, and then down to each county on the type of work we could do. Wintertime comes, and we're allotted X amount of tons per sand unless an emergency is declared. And you're told to put 200 pounds of uh, salt per mile. So that do you, don't sound like very much, but well, what, you, what it was, you could see that everything was beginning to come to a head, and concessions were taken, and concessions were taken. But do you su and, do you support the Senate Bill Five that would do away with collective bargaining in the state? Yes, in, in, in a term, and it's according to how they do go about it. Uh, because here's what's going to happen: if it goes to collective bargaining which, you know, or not collective bargaining, but if it goes, if House Bill 5 goes through, and basically from what I've heard, I was a previous union steward, they said they're going to walk in, and if this is passed, they're going to lay a paper down on the table. See, all right? And, and what I've heard right now is 50% cut in pay, which normal worker may make around $15. Your average worker in the state, and I'm not talking about uh, appointed positions, like county managers, different things like mm -hmm. that, but your regular HT highway worker. Uh, if you put them all together on average, you're probably looking at about $17 an hour, which sounds like a lot of money, and it is for here. Well, it's not, it it's, but, but it's not a ton of money, Tony. I mean, it's, no. uh, it's, it's not horrible. It's not minimum wage, but it's, it's barely a living if you have a couple of kids. I mean, you, you get into that, yeah, your spouse is probably going to have to work. It's, it's not a ton of money. I appreciate the call. More of your calls coming up next on 700 WL. Fox 19 Storm Tracker forecast. Today you got some sunshine, supposedly. <laughs> this afternoon, maybe. Breezy, though, high 44. Partly cloudy tonight, overnight low 24. Currently at the big one, it's 40. According to the uh, website for the Ohio Association of Public School Employees, they say that Senate Bill 5 targets 
all Ohio public workers. They say it is a direct attack on the middle class and low-waged worker workers in Ohio. A direct attack on the middle class and low-waged workers of Ohio. How is it a direct attack on the low-wage or middle-class workers of Ohio if they don't work in the public sector? There's more spin for you. There's more marketing, union marketing and spin. It's what about the children? It's protecting lives. It's you're not a resident here, Doc which I am. And it's also, it's an attack on the middle class and low class. Class warfare. Funny thing is, they have a flyer that they want people to support. Go up to uh, Columbus, protest against Senate Bill 5. Let me share some of the things on this flyer. Some of the things they say will happen. According to this flyer, they say Senate Bill 5 says no restrictions can be placed on an employer's ability to subcontract non-teaching services, making it much easier to privatize our jobs. This is specifically for teachers. So Senate Bill 5 would make it easier to privatize their jobs? Why, Why is that a problem? Oh, it's only a problem if you're a union rep. Because if you're a teacher, does, does it really matter? If, you're based, if your pay is based on merit and you're doing a good job, does it matter if yours is a private job as a teacher or one that you work, does that really matter if they privatize it and you go work for that company? No. It's just promoting the union here. It also says, according to their flyer, Senate Bill 5 removes health insurance from collective bargaining and mandates that we pay at least 20% of any health care premium. You mean like everybody else? How dare they expect us to pay into our retirement? Like all of you other stiffs in America. How dare you expect us to pay for our own retirement? Like all of those people on Social Security right now that don't have a choice. Their flyer also says, Senate Bill 5, says seniority cannot be the only factor in reduction in force, or RIF layoffs. And that collective bargaining agreements cannot restrict the implementation of RIFs. So, Senate Bill 5, they say seniority cannot be the only factor in reduction in force. According to the union then, seniority is the only way you can reduce the size Of the workforce, if you're going to, it has to be those that have been hired the soonest get laid off first. How about something like um, whether or not you do a good job? How about that? The union, once again, protecting the union. Does that really protect the children or education in the state? They should be saying, right on, Senate Bill 5. We're going to make it. If you do a good job, you'll have a job and make good money. And if you don't, you're gone. They're protesting it because they would rather keep bad teachers as long as they've been a bad teacher for a long time. You're a person coming out of college that does a great job, smart, graduated top of your class, a good teacher. You've been hired doing a great job, better than all those people that have been there 30 years. The union says you ought to be fired first so that person who's been a bad teacher for 30 years can keep their job. That's what the union is supporting here. Those are the things on their flyer. Based on those things, would you say the union is in it for you, for your children, for education? Or for the union? I think it's pretty obvious. Doc Thompson, 700 WLD. All right, coming up today on the big show with Bill Cunningham, a scandal in Reading, 133. Very curious what Bill Cunningham's going to be talking about. 133 today on 700 WLW. 
Let's go to Russ now in Dayton. Thanks for holding. Hello, Russ. Russ, are you there? Going once. Going twice. Joe Newton, or Newtown, rather. How are you? All right. How are you doing, Doc? Good, sir. Uh, I just wanted to bring up a few things. I'm in the public sector. I'm a masonry contractor, 56 years old, been doing it since I was 17. So for almost 40 years, I've had to bid every single job, be competitive, do a nice job to keep my job, uh, hire people that are qualified. If they come and tell me they're, they can do a certain kind of work, and I see after a day that they can't do that kind of work, then they either have to cut their pay or find another job. Uh, OSHA is out there to protect them safety-wise. I'm not going to ask anybody to work in an unsafe condition, but if they feel like that, that I am, they always have that power. Uh, but every job, every person that worked for me, the price is negotiated and always has been. I don't worry about pension. I just work. You know, I think that a lot of those people in those jobs are spoiled. So you think that um, when Mark San- uh, uh, Sanders said that, you know, if, if they didn't have collective bargaining, their job would be on their mind, their pay, their benefits, all of that, as opposed to the job th- that they're doing. You don't buy that? No. That's not what? how it is for you? You're not spending all day going, oh, my pay, my pension, my whatever? You're not, you're not doing no. that? No. No. If I, what's to stop me from, from hiring uh, 10 Marines that are fit in great condition and, and they, have, they have experience or want to get experience in putting out fires? Go and train for it and say, look, I got a group of guys that are way better than your guys. Sub it out to us. All right, I appreciate the call. Thanks so much for sharing with me. Rich Hoffman joins me now from No Lakota Levy Group. How are you, sir? Hey, fantastic. I wish everybody in the world lived in a, like a, in a bubble like uh, some of these cars <laughs> live in. Jesus, criminy. I, I was going to stay on the sidelines and not say a whole lot about this and just sort of let it do its thing. But when that guy said that he was entitled, that union leader, that they're entitled to certain things, it set my blood boiling. You know, as a taxpayer, I should be entitled to control some costs. I agree with you. I, have, I, I don't have a problem. I want people to be paid well, go and do the job. I just want it to be based on your merit and not on a group with collective bargaining. Precisely. You know, back when we, we, we talked a lot about the Lakota levy and the Mason levy, and then Levin has got a levy coming up, and little Miami's failing. When Lakota had their levy in, in, in 2010, their average teacher salary was $58,000. By the end of the year, it was $62,000, and they took a, a pay freeze. What nobody's talked about, and, and, and we're focusing on fire departments, fo- focusing on police, and everybody, we're focusing on the emotion. What this bill does probably better than anything that I've seen go through the state in a long time, it gives power to local communities to deal with their rising costs, and in this case, step increases. I didn't even really know what a step increase was until I worked on that levy. I didn't know that they could hide rising costs that way. And then I found out when you talk to the school board, what are you doing to keep your, your, yourself in budget? And they, they basically throw their arms up and said, it's out of our control. It's, it's a state law. They have step increases, and we've got to deal with it. So it means they've got to go to the voters over and over and over again in order to deal with their increasing budgets, which they have no control over. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand why this is such a difficult thing to, for people to understand, the, the concept of let's just allow local municipalities to negotiate as individuals to base things on merit and to do away with automatic raises just because you're there. Right, exactly. Here's the problem. You know, when when unions began, they had the whole progressive movement in the the teens and the 20s of the the last century, and in labor, they had all abuses from corporations, and the collective bargaining helped you know, put a little fear in, in the people to, to treat workers fair, and, and that was fine. But what's happened is unions have become as greedy as the, the corporations that they, they, they were protecting people from. The, the shoe's on the other foot. Now it's, it's completely turned around. Now they control everything. I, I don't elect union leaders. I elect my school board members and, and officials like that to deal with things like this. But if it's not in their hands, how can I, how can I deal with it? How can we keep our costs down as a community? That's a great point. You're right. How can, they, how can we keep the cost down if they don't have the ability to actually negotiate on our behalf? Instead, it's just an automatic, because of collective bargaining, step increase or things they right. can't do. Their hands are tied. So does our vote really count then? It, well, 
Well, no, it doesn't, and it hasn't. And that's why when we defeated that levy, and we defeated the levy before that, they basically, everybody, every school system in Ohio basically says, well, it's going back on again because those costs aren't going away. Why aren't they going away? Because they have no ability, the school board, that is, has no ability to control them because of these contracts, because of this, these collective bargaining agreements. They have... the. The unions have everybody over a barrel, and they become as corrupt as the, 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 the corporations and the big business that they accuse of being corrupt. Absolutely. And you know, my, Rich, I, I'm even okay with that. It, it, for years, the union contracts with the automakers became outrageous, and that was fine. I, you know, I didn't have to buy an American-made car, and but, I didn't have to, to pay their salaries. And eventually, knowing that they were going to kill the golden goose, and it did, they killed the golden goose. The problem is the government stepped in and revived it with our tax dollars. And, and the difference when it comes to public unions, you know, for the public employees, we are the employer. So if they're on an unsustainable path and the whole thing comes crashing down, I'm their employer they're taking down, too. Exactly. And all those people who are going up and they're testifying in front of in front of our representatives up there that the employers, the people, put up there to, to create legislation like this to give us some leeway and some negotiating power. When they go up there with their shirts pre-printed from all these massive organizations that they have, and they have all these sick days that they're allowed to take off, and, and they're actually encouraged to take off their jobs and go protest like that. The real workers are right now working. They don't have time to go up there and do this kind of thing. And they still don't have time to call on the radio and, or, or call their con- They're busy working. When, when you say that the working people, this is a bill that kills jobs, no, it doesn't. There's jobs I, I, every, all around us. Everybody. Are, are you going to go to uh, the Capitol this week? Do you have time to go tomorrow I, or Thursday? I, 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 I plan to do that. Uh, I was trying to try to find a way to get up there on Thursday. But we unfortunately got to work. I appreciate it. Rich Hoffman from No Lakota Levy Group. Thank you, sir. Hi. All right. Uh, here's what I was talking about. Um, the, the union people are going to be in droves heading to DC, or heading to, did I say DC, heading to Columbus to go ahead and um, protest against Senate Bill 5. However, there are a bunch of people that are in support of Senate Bill 5 that are getting together. There's two hearings um, that they're going to try to pack. That would be tomorrow at 2.30. This is in the South Hearing Room in, in Columbus, the South Hearing Room at the Capitol, uh, tomorrow at 2.30, as they hear testimony on Senate Bill 5. A bunch of people are going to meet up, though, to caravan to Columbus together. They're going to meet at the Country Kitchen, 123 and 71 in the parking lot. There'll be carpooling caravans and whatnot. Then on Thursday, it's a little uh, earlier, it's a 10 a.m. meeting. Thursday, also in the South Hearing Room. They're working on details to meet up in that. Probably have to leave real early, 6 or 7, to get up there in time for it. Two meetings tomorrow you can attend. Two thirty, uh, One tomorrow and one Thursday. 2.30 tomorrow and 10 o'clock on, Friday, on Thursday. Let's go to Bob in Indianapolis. You're on 700 WLW. Yeah, Doc, uh, just a quick question. Uh, why are we beating up the union? And understand now, I was in the union in a private sector many years ago. Uh, but why are we beating them up because of budget shortfalls? What about the administration that we have or have had in the past that, uh, pardon the expression, urinated all that money away, misappropriated it? Uh, uh, what about the heavy end of the uh, administrative cost of these uh, schools and, and fire departments and, you know, all the people in the, uh, uh, what's a good way to put it, the upper echelon? Well, that is certainly a- another piece of the puzzle, Bob. Another uh-huh. piece of the puzzle is the administrators, and I've attacked the administrators before. Yeah, some administrators are members of unions. Those that are not still are in it for themselves. Sometimes they go on and double dip. They have agenda, and they're out there for their own, their own jobs and careers as well. They're part of the problem. I'm not letting them off the hook. I'm not uh, saying they're not part of the problem. They absolutely are. But a union is definitely part of the problem. They have allowed bad employees to stay bad employees for years. And they defend that. Do you hear how they passionately defend that? Secretly, many. I'm going to go ahead and say most of those union members know that that's a bunch of garbage. But they figure, just shut the hell up, and I'll go ahead and keep my job. Shut the hell up, and I'll have all of these other perks that the private sector doesn't have. When are you going to stand up? When are you going to hold your union accountable for this stuff? When are you going to do that? When are you going to be honest and say we're all broke? 
Instead of just, well, I'm willing to cut other places that don't affect me. Doc Thompson, 700 WLW. Doc Thompson on 700 WLW. If you visit 700WLW.com today and click on Lance's Deal of the Day, you'll get four tickets to a Florence Freedom game for only $28. That's four for just $28. Look for the banner for Lance's Deal and take the family to see the Florence Freedom anytime during the regular season with 700WLW.com. We don't have the money, folks. We've got to look at it. We've got to look at all things and keep all options on the table at this point. The House of Representatives in D.C. spent $860,000 last year on just bottled water. $860,000 on bottled water. An average of $2,000 per member of Congress. 70% of the bottled water were Nestle products, mostly Deer Park. They could have installed for that $860,000 1,500 Public water fountains, just basic public water fountains. 1,500 of them around the Capitol. And then guess what? Next year, you can just zero line that. They could have installed over 900 refrigerated and purified water fountains for the $860,000. And even though that makes sense, it would save money, it's the right thing to do, Nestle who makes Deer Park, says that's the wrong thing to do. Sent a letter to Congress before this even hit the media. Said you shouldn't cut that. They say many of the claims being made against bottled water simply fail to provide a complete picture of bottled water's real environmental impact, and it's important as a contributor to healthy lifestyle. I don't care about any of that. It's $860,000 we wouldn't have to spend. Done. But once again, like the unions, Nestle comes out because their interests are at stake. Tom in Westside, you're on 700 WLW. Hi. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. I just had a few quick questions. I'm not here to argue, debate. Just want to give you some of what we feel are the facts. Lay it out. Okay. How's collective bargaining going to bail the state out from the screw-ups from the last 20 years? If they get rid of that, how will that help the state money? Do you want me to answer these or are you just going to run down the list? Oh, no, go ahead. I'll let okay. you go first. Well, first of all, the current contracts would be grandfathered in, so we would have to continue to pay for those. But in the future, it would bring contracts into if people, there's like in the power, and probably bring them into a more reasonable realm. Okay. And the other misconception out there, these firefighters and cops and teachers are getting these huge raises and this great amount of money is because they've saved money. They've been in the drop program. That's the that's their money, not the employer's money. They're putting that money in, and then they see these huge checks. That's not the case. It's not the city of Cincinnati or Cleveland saying, here, you are a great guy. We're going to give you $100,000. They earned that right throughout their career. Now, whether that was warranted or not, that's a debatable item. Well, you um, say you say earned. That's earned based on the, the contract. They took 10% of their check and put it towards the retirement out of the firefighter's check. Yeah, what I'm saying is, though, that was part of the contract. I think the entire system is flawed. Well, that's the state retirement system. No, I understand that. Well, and that's the reason I talked about the state retirement system in the past with the one uh, union member who told me that it's much better, that he would uh, prefer to have it. And I said, well, why shouldn't we all have it that good? Why why do you get the special state retirement system that's better? better?" And he said he was entitled. And some people think, you know, private fire companies think a 401k is the way to go. That's their right. We're not debating that. Um, we're one, you know, we're being targeted because the economy's bad. The guy that was making 150,000 a year snubbed his nose at us at Kroger's because we were making 35,000. Well, they don't have jobs. Now we're being targeted because we're an easy target. We're seen every day. We're seen on the streets. Well, they're getting paid to sleep. No, well, wait, wait a minute, Tom. You're you know, you're you're really going to say this is about class warfare? That's really where you're going to do here? That's the way we kind of see it on the streets. You well, know, that's we're being targeted. then no, you are completely missing the point, Tom. The okay. fact is, the rest of us don't have the luxuries that you are afforded. The luxury of not being fired, even when you screw up. Do you know how difficult it is? I mean, what am I telling you? You know, you know exactly how difficult it is to fire a bad employee, and you do get. Regular raises. Those are things the rest of us do not have. 
So you're going to cry poor and you're going to play the class warfare, yet another marketing trick, and say that guy that's working wherever making $100,000 a year and we are making thirty five. How many people are making $100,000 a year that are paying your salary? How many people are making $100,000 a year that pay via their taxes your salary? Many of them make about what you make. So don't come to me with the class warfare. That's just a game. Doc Thompson, home of the red, 700 WLW. Kids, let's go! All righty, that is it, ladies and gentlemen, the end of the Doc Thompson Show. But before we go, as always, let's find out what we learned today. We learned that on Valentine's Day, single and happy is just code words for desperate. We learned that smoking is worse than herpes. We learned that Doc is pro-teacher, pro-cop, and pro-firefighter. Unions are pro-unions. We learned that getting married on Valentine's Day gets you out of at least one present a year. We learned that some union members believe that they are entitled. Their word, entitled. And we learned on Capitol Hill that the water flows like money, which we also pay for. Have yourself a great day. Good night, Steve Cannon. Wherever you are, I'm young. Now, go home.